I don't think people should try and suppress their negative thoughts. I think there is great value, however, to introducing positive thought schemes. Does the mind have 100% power over what the body feels? No. So but it doesn't mean that it doesn't have a significant control over it. Say, it, I, say I feel cold and yeah, ice, right? It's, right? I'm in ice, it's 30 degrees. Right. Can I control my mind to say, you know what, this is actually a hot tub and you feel warm and you're feeling hot right now? Or is it too much physiological ba barriers to break through that? Uh, to some extent you can. So I think that, um, the question that you're asking is a very important one. It's actually the question, which is, to what extent does our subjective narrative, the our, story, we, the tell story we tell ourselves, actually mean something for the body? And to what extent do does the body actually mean something for the subjective narrative? So this gets into some areas of, of work that we're doing now, and so I do want to highlight that it's ongoing work, but I think, you know, the old narrative, meaning a few, 10 years ago, was that if you're feeling depressed, just smile. Well, if that worked, <laughs> right. we would have a lot less depression than we see out there. Right, right. Now that does not mean- well, Most people actually who are depressed just aren't smiling as right. well. Like when you change your physiology, doesn't it also start to change the way you think about yourself a the, little bit? The reason I call it a brain-body contract early on is that the brain and the body are constantly in dialogue. So, you know, the idea that when we're depressed, we tend to be in more defensive type postures. When we're feeling good, we tend to be in more like relaxed and extended postures, all true. But it does not mean that just by occupying the extended posture that I'm gonna completely shift the mind. Right. That's a first step. Think about like two interlocking gears. It's one gear that turns the other, but then they need to kind of dance together before you can get the whole system going. So and how so, do you get it to dance together? Exactly. So subjective, there is one way in which subjective thought and deliberate thought is very powerful over states of mind and body. You, to answer your question, can you think your way out of the ice bath being cold? So a couple things that are important. First of all, just to go a little deeper on what thoughts are. Thoughts happen spontaneously all the time. Mm -hmm. They're popping up like a yep. poorly filtered internet connection. <laughs> but thoughts can also be deliberately introduced. For instance, right now, I can say, okay, have a thought that um, just decide to write your name and you you can do that. I'm gonna to decide to write yeah. my name and you can do it. So that's a deliberate thought, which says that you can introduce thoughts. So I think it's very hard to control negative thoughts directly by trying to suppress them. They tend, generally, they tend to just wanna to continue to geyser up all the time, uh -huh. but we can introduce a positive thought. Can you think of two thoughts at the same time? Probably not. So you can only have one thought at a time. Right, but they come very fast. But it comes and goes. Get, comes, right. so, you have, be, so you have to constantly be right. intentional and deliberate about what you think, right. otherwise, and a spontaneous thought will pop back in right. based on your experience, based on sensory, based right. on how you're feeling or perceiving something, your environment, it's just gonna keep popping in. Right. So how do we deliberately have a positive thought more often? Right. So I'm, I'm a big fan of wellness and, and I think it's a great community, but it tends to run in absolutes and there, <laughs> and there aren't a lot of operational definitions as we say in science. And I, what I love about your question is you're asking for really getting to the meat of things, asking for the operational definitions. One of the most dangerous ideas in wellness and in popular psychology is that your body hears every thought you have. What a terrible thing to put wow. on people. You know, what, what, wow. a, what, a, what a challenging thing. I don't think people should try and suppress their negative thoughts. I think there is great value, however, to introducing positive thought schemes. Now, the reason is not because I think it's just because I think so, but because there's actually a neurochemical basis for controlling stress and actually making stress more tolerable and extending one's ability to be in bouts of effort. And that relates to the dopamine pathway. So the molecule dopamine is a reward. It's released in the brain when you win a game, you, you know, close a deal, you Someone meet likes the your love photo. of your life. Someone likes, Someone your, likes photo. your photo, <laughs> the great love of your life, you complete something. But most of our dopamine release is not from achieving goals. It's actually released when we are en route to our goals, where we're in pursuit of our goals, and we think we're on the right path. This is why a lot of people get depressed after they achieve a big goal, That's because right. they feel like, I'm supposed to feel something greater. I felt this thing for two minutes, and now that's it? That's right.
High achievers know to attach dopamine to the effort process. To the pursuit, the day-to-day tasks, the, the growth, the lessons, the losses, like everything, right? It, well, and it can be to some wins along the way, yeah. but growth mindset, which is the academic discovery and laboratory discovery of my colleague Carol Dweck at Stanford, is the hallmark of growth mindset is, to, is really two things. One is I'm not where I want to be now, but I, but I will, I'm capable of getting there eventually. The other is to attach a sense of reward to the effort process itself. In fact, don't reward the result, reward the effort. That's right. And if you look at true high performers, people that are consistently good at what they do, they don't peak and go through the postpartum depression and crash and come back and their life is a cycle of ups and downs, but really people who are on that upward trajectory consistently, those people attach dopamine to the effort process. And actually Carol's, one of her original studies on the discovery of growth mindset was these kids that love doing math problems that they knew they couldn't get right. So it's like the people love puzzles, but in this case, they knew they couldn't get it right, but they love doing it. And it incidentally or not so incidentally, these kids are fantastic at math when there is a right answer because they they feel some sense of reward from the effort process. Yeah. Now the cool thing about dopamine is that it's very subjectively controlled. We can all learn to secrete dopamine in our brain in response to things that are in a purely subjective way. Our interpretation. And our interpretation. And, but it has to be attached to reality. So, you know, one should never confuse. What is real? Right. So, no, so <laughs> if, you're eff, if you're thinking about the effort you're expending. So let's say somebody right now is financially back on their heels mm-hmm. and they're setting up a new business, for instance. And it's hard. If they can take a few moments or, or minutes each day to reflect on the fact that the effort process is allowing them to climb out of their hole potentially, that it's giving them an opportunity, that it's somehow po- they are on the right path or, or if they're not in movement along that path or at least oriented on the right path, they're not lying in bed all day. They're taking a the step They're forward. taking a step. If they can reward that process internally, two things happen. First of all, the brain circuits that are associated with building subjective rewards and dopamine get stronger, so you get better at that process. And second, and most importantly, dopamine has an amazing ability to buffer adrenaline and buffer epinephrine. And what I mean by that is, there was a study that was published in the journal Cell, excellent journal, Cell Press Journal, a couple years ago, showing that with repeated bouts of effort, we use and we release more and more epinephrine. It's kind of adrenaline, but in the brain. With more effort, we're every time, this. every time you put in effort. So every time you make for this, let's keep in. If I were to keep it in the business context, every time you make to write that email, every time you let's see, it's a, a person who's a craftsman or a craftswoman. Every time you're working in the in the shop and doing that, every bit of effort, you're taking a little bit of money out of this epinephrine account. You're spending epinephrine. Now, at some point, those levels of epinephrine get high enough that you, you feel like quitting. It feels exhausting. <laughs> and this was done in a beautiful study actually where um, they control the visual environments and they have the subjects ex- exert effort and they can control the visual environment. So sometimes the effort of, of taking steps and moving forward, this is actually kind of pushing forward and kind of swimming motion, um, would give them the sensation that they were actually making progress. And other times it was an exercise in futility where they would just keep the, the visual world stationary and they would expend effort and they didn't think they were going anywhere. My gosh. Epinephrine's climbing, 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 and eventually they quit. Now dopamine is able to push back on that epinephrine and give you anyone the, the feeling that you could continue and maybe even the feeling that you want to continue. And you've seen this actually, like football is a good example. Two teams play, say the Super Bowl, both teams are max effort the entire time. Yeah. Max effort. The team that wins suddenly in a moment has the energy to jump all over the place, party for days. <laughs> they can talk, I mean, they, they, they have They're exhausted energy. right before right. then. Well, that wasn't glycogen or stored energy of any kind, except it was neural energy. And what happened was effort is this adrenaline, 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 adrenaline. Eventually people quit. They just quit. The dopamine is able to suppress that. And so then you're expending effort, but you're doing it from a place of feeling like you have energy for it. So we need dopamine to keep the effort going. Is that what I'm hearing you say? That's right. Dopamine is not just about reward. 
It's one of the biggest misconceptions. Dopamine is about motivation mm. and drive. It's like a jet that propels you along a path. So how, any, how do we get more dopamine? You practice subjectively releasing dopamine in your mind. Like how? Okay, so th that's a great question. First of all, there are ways you can get more dopamine release through thoughts or through drugs or through supplements. I wanna be really clear. There is a drug, there are two drugs actually that will cause massive release of dopamine. They're called cocaine and methamphetamine. The problem <laughs> That's what is, gets us addicted because it feels so good. The problem is, exactly, the problem is <laughs> do, cocaine and methamphetamine stimulate so much dopamine release that the drug becomes the only source. It becomes the goal of and joy. the path. It becomes the path and the destination. And you look at people's lives when they do a lot of cocaine and methamphetamine and that baseline on their life goes down because there's no fast. reason to work hard at anything else because you feel good. That's right. And that's the greatest feeling you'll have, so why do anything else when you can have that feeling? That's right. And if you think about, do remember these neurochemical systems, adrenaline, cortisol, dopamine, epinephrine, they weren't designed to keep us safe from tigers and to hunt and gather or to build Fortune 500 companies. They were designed to do anything. They were designed mm -hmm. to be generic so that depending wow. on our circumstances, we could adapt. So wow. in an animal context, an animal that, um, let's say, is hunting or it needs food for its young, it's going to feel agitation. That's stress. That's cortisol. It's like hunger. My babies might not eat. I might not eat. Maybe it's looking for a mate. It's going to feel agitation and start looking and roaming and searching. Mm. Foraging is it's called in the animal behavior world. It's foraging. At some point, it might catch a smell of something, uh, a potential mate or berries or a stream if it's thirsty. At that moment, dopamine is released, and now it has energy to continue along that path. Mm. Whereas there's a specific pathway in the brain in, that's involved huh. in depression and disappointment that if it goes to that place and it turns out it was the wrong path, there's a signal that actually suppresses dopamine so that you don't repeat that mistake again. So you, you don't give up. That's right. You just don't repeat it again. That's right. And those events that- So it reminds you like, that's not the path to go down. That's right. Interesting. And, and we're sort of veering towards neuroplasticity here, which is the brain's ability to change itself in response to experience. Dopamine is one of the strongest triggers of neuroplasticity because it says those actions led to success previously. You're gonna repeat those. Don't do those. Those actions led to failure previously and don't repeat those. So, so dopamine triggers us to stay on the right path. Th that's right. So you asked, how do you do this? So to really yes. make it concrete. And is there too much, is there too much thing, is there such thing as too much dopamine? Well. If you're not on drugs? It, so cocaine and amphetamine are bad because they yes. lower the baseline on life. They make people very focused on things outside of themselves. That's the other thing that dopamine does. It can be positive or negative. But when we have dopamine in our system, we tend to be outward facing and in pursuit of things in our environment. You can look at somebody on cocaine and realize that that's the extreme version of that. But, but the, you know, I love social media for the reason that you see the mo molecules in the memes. So it's like, get after it, you know, what do sharks do on Monday? Or I can't remember the specific yeah. things. Or then they're the, like, sometimes it's just time to chill. Well, that's a different molecule, that's serotonin, right? And then dopamine is the get after it molecule. And epinephrine is effort. So if we were gonna break this down really concrete, yes. We'd say adrenaline and epinephrine are about effort, just effort with no subjective label on them, good or bad, effort. Whether or not it's stress or you're pursuing something you wanna do, it's just, it's in exerting effort. Dopamine is about reward, but more so about motivation and pursuit of rewards. If you want more greatness in your life, then you gotta check out this video right here. You know, people feel like they gotta be the best and they gotta be number one. But there's so much room out here for so many. Information is the only thing that's limiting the opportunities. Yeah. You know, everybody wants to be, keep it a secret. 